I've been bragging about you just so you know, not to make you nervous, but after last year, <laughs> I literally have been so excited about this and bragging about what you guys are doing and how ironic it is that we went from hemp to carbon and carbon is also such a huge conversation. In fact, um, I interviewed somebody this morning and we spoke about like carbon and hemp and the footprint in a number of different products. And so you guys will have to, I'll share the link with you or with you, Scott, and you guys will have to watch. It's like an hour interview all about carbon and hemp. <laughs> kind of cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. It's all yeah, you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining and watching. Um, and Mandy, thank you very much for allowing us to do this again. Um, that was awesome last year. So we're Hopefully this will be as good. So, um, so what this is, is our Ag Issues team. Um, we do quite a few different contests throughout the year and the Calm Crew Development events, but it's essentially, it's a contest. Um, this one, you pick an Ag topic or an Ag issue that pertains to pretty much anything agriculture, as long as you can relate it to what you're doing kind of in your local area or your, your region, your state, that kind of thing. Um, and then they research and put together a 15 minute presentation and they also have to submit a written piece with questions and things like that too. But the biggest part of this contest is that what we, once we get everything set, then they're supposed to do as many forums as they can. We have to do at least five. Um, but then anything above that is, is better. So we try to get at least 15 to 20. So I think you guys today will be like 11 or 12. So we've got about a week and a half to go. So we plan to get about a half a dozen more. So um, so, which is awesome. Um, so, uh, I guess the biggest thing is they're going to give you their presentation, but then any information you can give or ask them questions, that would be really helpful for them as well. Um, and probably when they're done, I'll have them come up closer so they're not like really far across the room. <laughs> so, um, so um, what we're doing today, um, because this is kind of a more of an official sit, uh, setting, is they're all in official dress. Um, but for the contest itself, uh, what we have done for many years now is that each of them, because they each kind of have a role, so each of them will portray a role, like a farmer or scientist or that kind of thing. So the ones that are doing that, which is the four on the outside, then they will have on an outfit that will match their part to kind of make it all kind of come together, uh, a little, little bit more visually easy to tell who's who. So, so official dress today because it's an official thing with you guys, but during the contest, they'll dress for their part. So um, the, the whole idea is that we give facts and pros and cons, and we never take a side. So the, the girls should never, you know, the whole idea is that they're a neutral informant, basically. So so they should never take a side. If one of you guys asks them specifically, what's your opinion, then they will potentially give, but they will stay neutral as they can because we don't want to get backed into that corner so to speak so <laughs> so does that make enough sense for everybody come on we'll hackle you we'll get you on one side or the other I'm just kidding awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um they still have note cards today uh, but by the, the contest is 29 days from today so yesterday was exactly a month away so um they still have note cards today but by the time of the contest it will be memorized um and then we're still kind of learning and researching and things too so if they, if you ask them a question or something that they don't know, they're going to tell you they don't know it. So now at the contest, we will do our best to, you know, give the best answer we can, but we don't want to give out incorrect information for the forums. So it's cool. Does that make sense enough to everybody? Awesome. All righty. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to them. Thank you. The Wild West continues to be a symbol of a new frontier in American society. Along with the opportunities that the Wild West promised, it also harbored uncertainties and a lack of regulation. Much like the Wild West, carbon trading provides new opportunities for agriculturalists in America. Along with the benefits carbon trading can offer, it also promises unpredictability and numerous unanswered questions. Let's envision life just 20 years from now. The year is 2050, when the world's population is estimated to reach a record high of 9.1 billion people. Now, let's take a step back and consider the impact. 
What could change? And what could remain the same? With the population booming as it's predicted to, major tensions could occur in the likes of people everywhere. One thing we know for sure is that the agriculture industry will have to overcome a variety of factors pertaining to the issue of increased carbon emissions in our atmosphere. As carbon emissions rise, scientists, agriculturalists, and world governments are desperate to find a solution. These emissions are causing an increasing threat to our environment. But is carbon trading the answer? Good afternoon. We represent the Amanda Clear Creek FFA chapter, and today we are here to speak with you about the future of the carbon trading industry and how implementing its use could shape agriculture throughout our country. Air pollution is all around us, with nearly 135 million Americans breathing polluted air every day, according to the American Lung Association. Though very few people give thought to it, many of our daily actions contribute to air pollution by adding greenhouse gases into our atmosphere. The majority of greenhouse gases come from carbon emissions, which account for a whopping 75% of emissions worldwide. The rise in greenhouse gas levels exaggerates the limiting effects of climate change. Climate change threatens agriculture all across America with heavier periods of rainfall, longer dry periods, inconsistent temperature patterns, and negative effects on crop and livestock viability. It is in, this, in context of this threat to agriculture and community at large that the idea of carbon trading was conceived. In 1997, 180 countries from across the globe came together in hopes of solving the climate crisis by reducing carbon emissions. This meeting produced the Kyoto Protocol. The goal of this protocol was to lower emissions by 5% from the years of 2008 to 2012 from the levels in 1990. The protocol created a conservation method which still has the potential to impact the agricultural industry through the carbon credit program they create. Carbon credits offer an opportunity for businesses, corporations, and farmers to get paid for emitting less carbon into the atmosphere. Carbon credits could provide a solution to rise carbon emissions and neutralize or possibly lower carbon emissions into the atmosphere. However, many are concerned that the technology isn't sophisticated enough to track carbon emissions does not exist or cannot produce reliable results. Today we unfold on a scene between an oil industry representative and an environmentalist at a protest. The environmentalist is concerned with the oil company's increase in carbon footprint, and the oil industry is understandably reliant on the continued use of fossil fuels to survive. Good afternoon. I am a communication specialist for the Environmental Defense Fund an environmental agency dedicated to finding sustainable solutions to help promote our environment. I am here today to speak with you about your company's recent increase in carbon emissions and your lobbying against our carbon trade bill. While we appreciate your concerns, there are many problems with your argument. As the Vice President of Public Affairs at the Tecla Oil Pipeline, it is my responsibility to ensure our demands are met. I recognize the incredible economic success of the global carbon, global carbon market However, curbing 80% of the world's energy isn't feasible. All sources of renewable energy are available, their efficiency remains dubious, and the impact on the environment is overstated. 2020 study conducted by the U.S. Department of Energy found that oil refineries account for just 2.7% of U.S. carbon emissions. Taking into account that my industry generates $110.7 billion annually, the United States is not currently prepared to initiate the complete transition in energy sources. Despite limited environmental benefit, the consequences of eliminating the oil industry could be disastrous. I understand your industry's dilemma, but according to a recent study by the Environmental Protection Agency, CO2 emissions have risen by about 90% since 1970, with agriculture being the second largest contributor. These statistics are alarming for environmentalists like myself, because if these trends continue, we can see irreversible damage to our natural environment. While this may seem like an ominous fact, carbon trade could be the answer to that problem. Carbon trade incentivizes companies to limit carbon emissions in order to have leftover permits to sell. Studies of this market have shown encouraging statistics that show carbon, carbon trade could work to decrease carbon emissions. A study from the World Bank showed that Carbon, carbon <laughs> trades cover up about 13% of global carbon emissions. In the hunt for ways to reduce our carbon footprint, this trade is a step in the right direction for our world. What many environmental groups fail to understand is the impact that the jobs here and at other pipelines have. 
The oil and natural gas industry supports 9.8 million jobs in the United States. This industry is not only in the top 10 largest domestic industries, but also supports many others. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, ag food and related industries contributed more than a trillion dollars to U.S. GDP in 2019. Without the work that we do here at the pipeline, the agriculture industry could not power the machinery they used to grow the world's food. As long as you and your group block the work we're doing, the industries we rely upon for food and fuel will suffer. Fortunately, according to the New York Times, the money generated from this market is cycled back into clean energy programs. And several companies have already shown interest in the carbon credit business. The fact that farmers and businesses have shown focus on helping the environment is a promising sign. We just heard from a communication specialist for the Environmental Defense Fund who believes carbon credits could offer a solution to rising carbon emissions. Agriculture is the second leading contributor to carbon emissions, and she believes carbon credits could incentivize farmers and businesses to reduce their carbon footprint. However, the Vice President of Public Affairs at Tyco Oil Pipeline has expressed the risk that carbon credits could pose to society. The fact that 80% of energy in the United States is fossil-based is a valid problem. Eliminating oil production would cripple all national activity, including agriculture, across the United States. Our next dean is at an annual Ohio Farm Bureau meeting. Our speaker for the day is an economist representing the Ohio State University, and the other is a farmer who has concerns on how carbon trading will affect farmers across the U.S. Thank you all for attending our session on carbon trading in Ohio. I am excited to share with you our potential carbon traders, the economic possibilities associated with carbon trading. As an economist at OSU, I've had the chance to study the financial benefits of carbon trading. Carbon dioxide is the number one greenhouse gas. Carbon trading can help reduce the amount of carbon being emitted and provide economic gains for farmers. In a study conducted by Purdue University, it was found farmers made an average of $20 per an acre when using carbon sequestering methods. Farmers find carbon credits can be positive for their land due to increased soil health. Practices which are associated with carbon credits are known to be good for the soil. Using no-till operations, for example, does not disrupt the top layer of soil. This results in less chance of erosion for this nutrient-rich and very vital, vital soil layer. Specific cover crops, such as crimson clover, can actually increase nitrogen levels in soil, bolstering future crop growth. This saves the farmer time and money of spreading nitrogen on the fields. Dr. Perry, you make some very good points regarding how carbon trading can lead to economic growth, but there are a few problems with your argument. Farmers are only getting paid based on their soil carbon test results. In an article published by the Environmental Defense Fund, it revealed that remote sensing technologies are still in testing phases and may not be 100% accurate. Farmers are worried about relying on such technologies to determine their compensation. They fear that if the tests are inaccurate, they will not receive the money that they rightfully earn. In addition, cover crops can actually cost more per acre than farmers are receiving in soil carbon credits. This results in a net loss for the farmer, meaning taking part in the carbon trading system costs the money instead of creating it. Ms. Song, you have listed some challenges facing carbon trading, but the environmental and economic benefits from the use of carbon credits far away the concerns. There are, carbon, there are companies looking to buy and sell carbon credits from farmers all over the United States that earn money, such as Cargill, Syngenta, and Nutrient Ag Solutions. There are numerous other companies who are looking to purchase these carbon credits in order to become carbon neutral. By buying the credits, these ag companies are giving farmers somewhere to sell their credits for profit. Farmers that are on the lower end of the carbon emitting spectrum can volunteer to become carbon friendly and sell their carbon credits that they do not need. These farmers would thus be making a profit since each farmer is allotted a certain amount of free carbon credits. Admittedly, the economic and environmental impacts of carbon trading are enticing. However, these contracts do not support all farmers in the nation. According to the Economic Research Service sector of the United States Department of Agriculture, approximately 39% of the 911 million acres of farmland in the 48 contiguous states was rented. Many carbon trading contracts are long-term and range from five to 10 years long. 
Farmers are worried about entering such lengthy contracts because they fear that the buyer, their own, the landowner, could end the contract. If this was to happen, they would have to end their carbon trading contract early, potentially paying out their buyer. Such a loss could be devastating to a farmer's livelihood. We just heard from a prospective economist who believes in the economic benefit of carbon trading and a farmer who is concerned about the potential issues of compensation in harmful contracts. Both the EDF communication specialist and economist from OSU believe that there are numerous benefits associated with carbon trading. From the environmentalist standpoint, carbon trading incentivizes companies to limit their CO2 emissions in exchange for financial gains. Money from the carbon trading market also has a high chance of being reinvested into clean energy programs further reducing emissions. Looking at the financial pros, the economist makes some valid points as well. Practices associated with carbon credits, such as no-till farming, are good for the soil and decrease the chance for erosion, leading to benefits including higher crop yields. Many opportunities are available for these farmers to invest in carbon trading, which open the door for carbon credit ad companies to profit as well. While the communication specialists and economists do bring up good points on carbon trading's benefits for our environment, the farmer and vice president of public affairs at Petco Oil Pipeline share valid concerns on how it will damage the economy. The fossil fuel industry sustainably curbing its emissions, responsible for 80% of national energy, is not practical for the United States. This industry provides fuel necessary to transport food across the United States and power the farming equipment needed to produce it. If this industry collapses, it would cause an economic crisis as millions would be out of jobs, with consequences reaching far beyond agriculture. In 1962, President Kennedy famously stated that we choose to go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. The remarks he gave to Rice University that day carry a special message about the idea of the American frontier. At the beginning of our presentation, we asked you to imagine the Wild West just as Kennedy asked the country to do so during the space race. The United frontier was met without difficulty and sacrifice. For years, Americans braved unknown territory in pursuit of a better life. Today, carbon credits represent the uncertainties of this country's newest frontier. We continue to look for ways to stimulate the growth of American technology while simultaneously ensuring the environmental longevity of our planet. As oil workers, we understand that fossil fuels will eventually run out. But before that happens, we are trying to find alternative power sources while still providing jobs to those already in the industry. I see the potential for a world that benefits economically from carbon trading, despite the financial dangers associated with this unexplored territory. What may prove lucrative for many farmers could spell disaster for countless others. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts so we may better understand the debate. But there are still apparent disagreements on whether carbon trading is a viable solution to limit our carbon footprint on Earth. This conversation that took place here today gave us. As environmentalists, oil industry representatives, economists, and farmers, a more encompassing view on the issue. The Humane Surfing FFA chapter would like to thank you for your time and will now answer any questions they may have. Good job, ladies. All that was open, great. Yeah, I was going to say, Kayla, I'll open this up to you guys or anybody else that's on if you guys have questions. Last year we did this, and I see Tim, you're on. Um, and Santiago, Sandra, Daryl logged on. Um, I know you guys missed some of the presentation. It is recorded, but do you guys want to give a little bit of background about? kind of start, let those that joined know kind of what, what kind of feedback are you looking for? Where, where do we go from here? Are we all on screen? Yep, you're good. Yeah, you guys are great. Um, I think we're just looking for any questions that anybody has. That's a great thing for us to go off of because in this contest, we truly don't know what a judge is going to ask. So the more questions we get, hopefully the more prepared we can be. And if there's any information that you guys want to share with us about your personal experiences with carbon trading or what you've heard, we're really looking forward to hearing about it. Awesome. Well, I'm going to let Kayla or Hector or Daryl, anybody else, Santi. Anybody else that have questions or comments? 
I, uh, I'll chime in real quick. Um, so I know last year the topic was hemp and I'm, I'm interested to see an argument that would go for not necessarily hemp, but plants that sequester carbon and put it back into the soil. In addition to, um, no-till farming and, um, cover crops to, to, you know, hemp also helps phytoremediate the soil as I know you girls know. Um, so I would be interested in this presentation to hear how that additional change by adding in, um, plants that do help heal the soil in addition to, you know, the, the standard crop rotation, um, how that would be a pro in, in creating more carbon credits. So that is, that is something that I would love to hear. And I just want to give you huge kudos. Your, um, presentation was phenomenal. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Anybody else? Yes, I have a quick question. I'm like, when it comes to the farmers, um, what other incentives, you know, would you give them um, to start doing this work? Because a lot of farmers are not really thinking in $20 an acre, you know, that's not a lot of money for some. They might not see it as a lot of money. So how can we, um, I'm a farmer, so how can I convince other farmers to do this? So I think there's a multitude of different aspects that can go into this answer, kind of depending on exactly what way the farmer is going to go about trading this carbon. Um, one of the things we actually spoke to a local farmer here in our area, and we focused more on the cover crop aspect, and that was something that he was exploring. And when he would get that twenty dollars with his soil, or with the carbon credit, he can also report those acres of cover crops to the farm service agency and actually get money for that. Since your um, Cover crops aren't your main crop and they're not your cash crop. They don't technically have to be reported. However, if you are reporting them, you're actually going to get more compensation. So we're seeing that that's another avenue farmers are looking at. Not only are they getting the $20 in the carbon credit, but they're also able to capitalize on the money from start farm service agency when they report those cover crops. We also found um, in a lot of our research that along with uh, different various uh, carbon trading bills or pieces of legislation. Um, it also included tax incentives. Um, so for farmers who didn't necessarily have, um, or had maybe livestock or they didn't have crops, um, there were tax incentives for solar panels, hydroelectric power, um, wind power turbines. So there was more opportunities than just um, crops. And you have to think more just than about profit, more like environmentally. As a farmer, the whole purpose of carbon trading is really to just lower carbon emissions. So using that would really help your crop rotation. Global warming and everything hurts your harvest. It can have longer dry periods and inaccurate weather patterns. So that's really going to hurt your crop. So by carbon trading everything, you can really help the global warming guys. And I think the last piece that's important for farmers to understand that $20 is an average when you're selling your carbon credits to aggregators such as Nutrient Ag Solution or Cargill. However, depending on kind of your risk analysis, you also have the opportunity to enter into the trade market similar to what you would do with your stocks. In that case, a single soil carbon credit can range anywhere from $14 to $147. So we're seeing that some farmers want to know that they're going to have consistency and they're sticking with those aggregators, where others are going to continually assess the risk analysis like they would in the stock market to try and sell their credits on the different markets that we're seeing here in the United States, which can help raise that money a little bit. How can we educate farmers about that program? I think, I think that, you know, through our forums, we have been able to speak to a lot of people who were not as informed. And that's been our main goal throughout all of this, throughout our competition, is just to be able to educate farmers because we've seen a lot of uh, misinformation and just not a lot of great communication between the third uh, party companies who are looking to buy the carbon credits and the farmers who are going to be harvesting that. So I think throughout our competition, our main goal has been to learn as much as we can so that we can go forward and help educate others. Because at the end of the day, that's what this competition is all about is to be able to spread information and you know show both, both sides of the argument. We also had the opportunity yesterday to spend the day at the State House, and we also went to Ohio Farm Bureau. So that was a great opportunity for us to speak with our legislators and those who are representing 
the agricultural community to let them know about a very prevalent issue and what they can do to help educate farmers as well in that process. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. You are great, amazing young adults, and I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Very informational, very educational. You are our future education on this. Yes, Go ahead. I, I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Santiago from Argentina in the south part of the continent, far away from where you're from. Congratulations <laughs> for this presentation. Um, Mandy, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and I will be glad we are always open to, to hear things about you and know that here in the south part of the continent, you have uh, the open doors to do what you, you need to do regarding this carbon credit stuff. And thanks again and congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. We appreciate that. I have a question about um, when you talked about the different price range, right? From $14 a carbon credit to $147 a carbon credit. Um, what's the understanding of the complex credits compared to the simple credits? And then the, um, you know, when we look at life cycle analysis of products and we've got a uh, credit that's distributed at the farm or at the soil, one for the biomass after the hemp is produced. And then what about the end product, you know, a textile, you know, piece of clothing or an erosion mat compared to a hemp block? How are, or what do you know about how credits are allocated for a product that is soil to you know, shelter basically? So I'll start first talking about the difference between the simple and the complex um, carbon credits that I kind of touched on a little bit earlier. Really, yeah. and that I would like to just kind of depends on the contract that you're in. We talked a lot yesterday at Ohio Farm Bureau. There's an industry standard for what number two yellow corn is. Most farmers in the nation, if you say yellow to number four and they understand what that means, that there's a certain moisture content, um, a certain weight per bushel on that corn. And we're looking to establish the same thing with carbon credits that way, no matter what market you're selling at, you know that you're meeting that industry standard. However, when we're going with our aggregators, we're seeing again that that's a more consistent price, where when you're entering the market, that's going to fluctuate just like we see in stock. Can I make a comment really quick? Yes. yes. So much of it has to do with where, and anybody else would be interested in you guys chiming in, because I am not a carbon expert, but... So much of that complex credit has to do with where that credit is going, right? And what's happening to it, the different phases of that. And so if say Hector, for example, as a farmer is being paid at the farm level for that carbon credit, it's a very different simple credit compared to somebody that's being paid for the construction material at the end, right? So the complexity of tracking it from seed or basically seed through harvest, transportation, you know, the way that it's processed and then where it's processed into that end block or end product is a much higher value carbon credit, right? Than something that's at farm. Is that what you understand? And anybody else, if I'm speaking wrong to this, but do you guys haven't, do you, have you guys looked into that or do you guys understand that part of it? We're looking into that and that's something that is continuing to develop, but right now we're more focusing on the farm side because that's where we're seeing the most data be available is we're speaking to local farmers and other industry representatives who are on the scene and they're working with it every day. So they're more seeing what they're receiving as a farmer. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a podcast yesterday on the way up and it was someone who was talking about they just sold their credits and how much money they got for that. Just looking at the farm level, not the end product of what they were getting or what was being produced with that. So right now we're really just seeing what the farmer is getting in that very okay. simple. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. I'm curious, obviously, transferred. And then to this morning, I heard on a podcast on an interview that I did that 60% of the carbon is in the soil and then 40% of, at least with hemp, then 40% of the, the uh, carbon is above soil. Um, so that's interesting. It was an interesting number um, to look into. No. Anybody else? 
have anything, Tim? I saw you have a question. I don't know if you want to answer in or chime chime in on it. Yeah, I just I really appreciate the presentation. I think they should be really proud of themselves. I'm impressed, super impressed, and um, I just think there is the potential possibly to look at multi-year crops compared to single-year crops, and possibly develop planting systems where the two are planted in the same field so that part of the field always has plants actively growing. And I'm curious if there are any aspects of the carbon program that address whether it's a annual crop or some multi-year crop, whether it's raspberries or, um, you know, uh, uh, apple trees, or even um, I believe Rich out in Oklahoma is looking at a hemp uh, concept where there'll be trees which would also be used for construction industry interplanted with hemp and the trees would grow for three to seven years as an example. Right. And I think that that's definitely something that is going to develop as the system develops right now. We're more focusing on our row crops, really the three main common ones that we're focusing on right now are looking at corn, soybean, and wheat. Wheat itself actually has its own carbon trading market where things, uh, where those carbon credits can only have come from a farm who's producing wheat. So as of right now, we're not seeing a lot of carbon credits coming from farms who have plants that are going to last for more than a year. That's definitely something that we're looking into, though. I live on a Christmas tree farm, so I was actually asked the question yesterday, how does that impact forestry? Um, and that's just something that we don't quite have answers yet on, but that's something that we're looking into and hope to find more information about because a lot of farmers are asking those questions right now. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much. I can hear us echo. <laughs> I'm scared to talk because it's going to echo. <laughs> nope, we're good. Okay. So, any other questions, you guys? Do you guys, do you ladies have anything for us? Um, just a, a shout out to those that are on the call. We are going to do this again next week and um, we'll have more people on the call and open it up for a bigger discussion. Um, but, do you guys have any questions for us or anything that you're needing from us, maybe, that we could help with? Not that I know of, no, but thank you guys for getting on. We appreciate it. Just, just giving the opportunity to give our presentation in front of another audience and asking even more questions is really one of the biggest things that we can ask for. So thank you all for that. We appreciate it. Good job. Okay, well, good job. Okay, we'll come back next week. I'll come back next week. Sounds good. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hold on just a second? I have a couple questions for you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Um, did you get, I texted you our signature sheet picture so it's a little closer than that one okay okay does that make sense so what we do to keep track of and prove that we've done what we do is is get a representative from the group to sign it so you're a little far away to get your signature maybe but if, if i can just print your name in there <laughs> is that okay to do that yes yes okay so and we've done that. We've done that a couple of where we've done it remotely. We did like uh, uh, the certified Angus beef a few years ago, and they're there in like Montana or something like that. And we just print the name in. We don't, you know, we don't sign or anything. We just print the name in. So. Perfect. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, very helpful. Uh, as every time they get a chance to present it again and answer questions and all that and discuss it, it helps a lot. So awesome. Be good. It was great. And then yeah, what, what day were you thinking next week? So I make sure I get it right. I think it was Thursday. We decided, let me make sure Thursday. you're on the calendar. Okay. So it'd be Thursday the 7th. Yep. I've got it on. Okay. Awesome. Then it's two o'clock. Does that work? I mean, it'd be just a touch after two like today. So our school ends at two o'clock. So by the time they get turned around and to the room where we're going to present it, it's a touch after. So. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Awesome. And we'll, we'll talk and kind of speak. Um, I'd be interested in having you guys present for our drawdown team. We had a group that competed for drawdown. Um, are you familiar with the X prize competition? No. They put together a drawdown team to show if 
they basically calculated and Daryl was really involved in that, but they, they calculated, um, end products that were made with hemp. And if we converted to using them with hemp, what the carbon footprint would look like, how much they would be able to draw down as well as avoid and, you know, avoid by making the transition. And so they, they put together a whole bunch of different products and kind of roughly estimated on some and got really good numbers on others. Um, and then we're able to show by converting to you know, say top five products, it would sequester X number of gigatons of carbon a year. So cool. Yeah. And then yeah. Musk opened up a, 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 a program basically where you compete, you submit applications um, to prove that you could draw down X number of tons of gigatons of carbon. And you go through these phases and the application was very, very intense. Um, but these guys submitted just recently. And so now they're waiting to hear back, I think, on whether or not they made it through the first round. So that's a hundred million dollar total prize from Elon Musk um, all around carbon. Not, not a shabby bit of money. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's broken, right? The, the first place prize is 50 million and then the there's okay. other places, but to get through first round, you get, you know, like incremental funding basically to prove out this content concept of drying down carbon. Pretty cool. cool. Yeah. I mean, if we can work it out to where I can get them to you like this, that'd be great. Wow, this is perfect. And I'll just have the, I'm going to send an invite because I think they would just be interested in hearing this, the girls talk about it. Okay, cool. Yeah, get involved. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, cool. Well, I think that is good unless you guys have other questions of me. Um, I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as they are, although they've all <laughs> headed out for their practices and work and they're all <laughs> picking up their younger siblings to take them home and such things. So, um, yeah, so we will plan on the seventh, so a week from today, and should be perfect. Daryl, I saw your mic came off. Do you have something you want to jump in on? No, you're good. Oh, yeah. No, I was arguing with the cell phone connection. Oh, I got <laughs> awesome you. Awesome presentation, though. Awesome. I, I love to see the FFA involved. It's awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, the, the girls really have done a great job of researching and and looking into the different topics. I know mean, last year was the, the global hemp, which is obviously a little more, more pertinent to you guys, but I think the carbon fits right in too, as far as that's another, you know, just another bonus. Well, hemp's so. biomass that it's able to produce, right? If, yeah, the amount of biomass that hemp produces makes it a real game changer. And then being able to lock that biomass up in the end products creates like, a major carbon impact that is really drawing the attention of these conversations. That's great. Yeah. Well, they were writing down notes too. So all of that is just more information they can add in to just their overall knowledge. So, and they're, the question and answer session in the contest itself is really important as far as how they do in that. And that's, this is great information for that because they can add in more and more and more. So I'll send you over an interview that just kind of talks about just hemp and carbon. Um, okay. Because I'd be interested from them. I heard her say they're focusing on the top three, but with emerging crops and emerging technology, it's yeah. definitely. And obviously, yeah. we eat, breathe, and sleep hemp, but. Right, <laughs> right. sure. <laughs> uh, well, they focus more on the corn, beans, and wheat because that's, you know, the the traditional agriculture side of it. So that's, that's, what, what, that's what we're going to take over, Scott. You wait and see. Right. Next year, it's going to be corn, bean, wheat, and hemp, right? So. <laughs> corn, it, what they say by 2030 or 2020, so it, hemp will be number three or number five in top crops. Oh, or it is number five and moving to number three, something like that. That's awesome. Don't quote yeah. me. But <laughs> I'll pull the I'll pull the report I saw. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So cool. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's the one thing that that people don't quite I don't know maybe don't understand. I'm probably not the right way to say it, but I mean farming is a business. So you know farmers grow corn and beans and wheat for the most part now as row crops because that's what they can make the most profit on, but if there are other crops that would be more profitable, 
people were going to grow it because they could make more money. I mean, hemp will be a ro- rotation crop, right? It'll fit right in to soybean and wheat and corn on big. Yeah, yeah. that's where it's headed. That's definitely what we're seeing, right? It's not the horticulture grow that everybody was got into, even what they they studied last year. You know, numbers have changed drastically on expected acre but acreage shifting from CBD to fiber and grain. Yeah. Well, the possibilities there, I mean, you know, paper. <laughs> yeah. You grow know, hemp a lot faster than trees. So those kind of things are just, I think, you, know, you opened my eyes to all that last year, like huge, because, you know, it's just, we just didn't know. And all the other products that are available from that is, is I think that's, that's the future right there because it's such a, you can it's use it for so many exciting. things. Yeah, very much. So. Okay, I'm going to send you this link from this interview this morning and then let's just keep chatting. However, we can help you. Um, I, I'm going to invite Jamie too. I don't know if you have already reached out to the Midwest Hemp Council group. Have you already done something with them? Uh, we did last year. We have it this year. She would love to support you again. So I'll invite her on Thursday also. She just thinks the world of you guys. And so I'll just invite, yeah, make sure that they they are participating and just get to hear your presentation also. So cool. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for Absolutely doing stop. Really appreciate it. So thanks. Thanks. Thank you.